The last few years have been challenging for many of us, and I for one will admit this. But through education, mentoring, support and planning, I'm excited about the future of my business, even in this dry period. As Stu spoke about before, I was surprised when I was asked to speak, but not many of us can comprehend or relate to Ebor's so-called drought with 800 mils of rainfall. I've been asked to share my story, the roller coaster of the highs and lows, the mistakes and the wins, what I have learned and where I plan on going. I want to admit I don't know everything. I have made plenty of mistakes and I have a lot to learn. At the beginning, I didn't feel I had control of my business, my financials, how much feed I had in my paddocks and how many cattle I could handle. I was unbelievably hungry for information, but I wanted to know it all yesterday. This consistently made me feel, uh, left me feeling overwhelmed, frustrated, stressed, incapable, and the list goes on. I think we should all remember we all have different visions, goals, farms, and bank accounts. What has worked for me might not, not necessarily suit your business, but it's through education and planning that myself, my business, and my farm are in a, lot better, in a, in a much better place mentally, financially, and ecologically. I don't know how to, there we go. Oh. I'll put it down. Before I get into it, I'd like to share a bit about myself and a few important people. I grew up in Sydney and believe not being a generational farmer is an advantage. I'm lucky I don't have preconceived ideas about how to run the farm. The start of my regenerative journey was reading Rachel Treasure's books growing up. It has always made me question what we do and why. My dad, top right, dad lives in Sydney and is meant to be retired but keeps himself extremely busy. I probably don't tell him enough, but every day I'm thankful for not only helping me invest in a farm but also for believing in me. We've written our goals and visions together and he is 100% on board with the regenerative practices we follow. Hugh, my fiancé, bottom left. Hugh's, in the, Hugh's the cattle manager on his Farm, uh, family's conventional farming and cattle property at Breeza. We've been on this journey together into regenerative agriculture and he's been endless support and encouragement. Jimmy, bottom right. Jimmy is one of my neighbours who started adjusting cattle on the farm early on. He soon became the muscles on the farm when needed and has spent many hours teaching me practical skills. I would hate to count the hours he's spent in the buggy with me while I blabber on about grass. But nevertheless, he's always supported me and always been there to run the farm when I'm off at schools or away. The farm. We bought 2,300 acres on the edge of Liverpool Plains at Blackville, about an hour and a half southwest of Tamworth. It ranges from creek flats to steep hill country, but predominantly all heavy black soils. This photo was taken once we settled. Spring 16 had been exceptional. The property had already been divided up into 60 paddocks, some into cells, but with a huge range in paddock sizes from about 1.5 hectares to 200 hectares. As I mentioned, Jimmy had just had 40 cows and calves on the farm, but I was ready to go in guns blazing and buy some of my own. I had no idea how much feed I had or how many cattle to buy, so I just started buying. I had the grand idea of direct selling grass-fed beef to consumers under my own brand. To do that, I needed a cow, and calf her a cow herd to have consistency of good homegrown beef to sell. At the dearest point of the market, in November 16, we purchased 100 overpriced, but very well-bred cows and calves. To add to that, I also purchased, 100, purchased 180 trade steers in December and January. I had been attending numerous one-day events around the, around the area on regenerative agriculture and was soaking in as much information as possible. I was learning about soil health, stock density, and plant rest and recovery, so I boxed all my cattle together and started moving them around the paddocks. Not having the knowledge and ability to match my stocking rate to my carrying capacity ran me unstuck. Overstocking, overgrazing and poor mob psychology were some of the results I faced. To put it simply, I, had, I just had too many cattle for the grass I had available. Once I thought a paddock was heavily grazed enough, I would move the mob onto the next paddock. Eventually the mob had made their way around the entire property. During this time, due to minim minimal rainfall, the plants had not had time to recover. Even though the plants were not recovered, I had to put the cattle somewhere. This is where overgrazing occurred. 
regrazing plants that had not had the chance to fully recover. I had started the vortex, the downhill spiral. Every time I moved the mob around the property, their moves would get faster and faster due to the, feed, uh, the lack of feed in the paddocks. In the cells especially, even today, I can see the degradation I created from grazing, uh, by grazing re unrecovered plants. I have noticed this by increased bare, uh, bare ground and less desirable plant species. Another result of poor management was mob psychology. I had not run such a large mob in little paddocks before. Each time my cattle saw my red buggy, they would head for the gate waiting for the next move. The cattle were not, uh, were not only unsettled, but I now also believe hungry. The result of this was poor average daily gains, sickness, and plenty of pink eye. It is very simple. If I had started destock, uh, if I started destock, if I had started destocking uh, in this period, I would have been able to slow down my moves due to less mouths or less LSUs. This is why using a grazing chart, feed budgeting, and forward planning is extremely important, and I'll touch on this later. Thankfully, in the middle of Feb, Hugh and I started grazing for profit, run by RCS with teacher Terry McCosker. If you have not done the school, I could not recommend it highly enough. It really was a life-changing experience that deals in depth with every part of your life, production, ecosystem and business. It touched on every question I was asking and more. We were lucky enough to visit Wilmont for our one day on-farm uh, on trip. This is where I firstly met Stu, who impressed me with his knowledge and passion for regenerative agriculture. I knew leaving GFP I would have many questions and I was feeling overwhelmed and unsure where to start. I was thankful to find out RCS run a follow-up follow -up course, Next Steps, where I could have access to a personal coach for six months. I remember coming home from GFP, excited to start all the new things I'd been learning, but soon realised after being away for seven and a half days, you get stuck in the same old routines of jobs. Thankfully, my Next Steps coach kicked me into the gear and kept me accountable for finishing my tasks. I wish I could stand here and say, the day I finished GFP, I started my grazing chart. But unfortunately, I was busy focusing on other areas of my business that also needed improvement, mainly my financial literacy. Throughout the Next Steps program, that was my focus. Another focus of mine over that period was my family. In May, we lost both my mum and grandfather. My personal life is not normally something I share, but as I'm sure you're all aware, people are the most important part of our businesses, and therefore, for a period, my mind wasn't, fo my mind wasn't focused on the farm. In October, I was lucky enough to host Terry McCosker for an RCS Keep in Touch Day at our property. A great opportunity to have like-minded people come together to share knowledge and ask questions. Since I had the privilege of Terry being on farm, I organised him to stay an extra half a day as a consult. We ran figures on breeding versus trading and we concluded for my business, trading would be a more viable and profitable venture. This would increase my turnover and create more regular cash flow. Although I had seen the figures firsthand, I was struggling to comprehend selling my overpriced cows and letting go of my grass-fed beef dream. Thankfully, the other outcome from that day was the start of my grazing chart. In January 18, after attending a Dick Richardson field day here at Wilmont, I decided to scribe to my grazing. Since Terry had left, I'd been struggling to keep my paper grazing chart up to date and decided having an online website and app for my phone would be much more convenient. Using Maya has been a game changer for me. I currently use it to track purchases, sales, deaths, all my cattle moves, changes in LSU ratings, rainfall and treatments. I use different tools and reports such as panic, paddock analytics, forecasting, feed budgeting and stock, report, uh, stock flow reports. Since you've already seen this screen and sort of been explained, I guess, how it works, but I'll try as well in case, uh, for those of you that um, aren't on my or don't have a feed budget or grazing chart. Um, to start with, if you look at the bottom of the screen, I've added an order of events to the timeline. So far, we've made it to January 18. Started using my grazing and grazing chart. If you look at the top, I've added orange arrows to show you which months I have sold stock. The green arrow shows where I took on adjustment. The black lines are my benchmark or carrying capacity. The top black line is my normal benchmark when not in drought. 
Since starting Maya, I have had to drop my benchmark by half. This is the rule when in the second subsequent year of a drought on heavy black soils. Until Jan 18, my benchmark was 30 stock days per hectare per 100 mils, and I've now dropped it to 15. The blue columns are my monthly rainfall totals. The blue line is my 12 month rolling rainfall. Looking at the green line as my cows, the aim is for the green line to stay under the black line by benchmark. The general rule is if your green line is rising for three consecutive months, it's a fair indicator you need to start destocking. So let's look back over 2017. You can see I started destocking monthly between July and November. In fact, I sold 250 head. But when you look back at the green line, it started rising from March. If I was using my, gra my grazing chart back then, I would have realised earlier I needed to start destocking quicker and harder. I see two benefits from this. The first, the market over that period had been falling. I would have got a greater cents per kilo for my cattle selling them then. The second, I would have reduced the number of LSUs on my property, therefore not eating as much grass and probably not needing, needing to destock as, as heavy later on. If you look back at the blue line, rolling rainfall, you can see from August 17 to October 17, it's severely declined. As I mentioned at the start of my speech, when we purchased, it was an exceptional spring. Because those large rainfall events are dropping off the 12 month rolling rainfall here, causing the severe drop, you would expect the green line to do the opposite, dramatically climb, which it has. You might be thinking, you did, you did start destocking, and yes, I did, but it did take me long to finally decide it was the right decision. If I was using a grazing chart at the time, I would have been observing these things and been able to plan and react quicker, uh, plan and react quicker which would have improved my bottom line. In Feb 2018, Hugh and I travelled to Brisbane for the KLR Marketing School run by Rod Knight, Graham Reese and Jim Lindsay, based off Bud Williams' principles. The KLR principles are focused on increasing cash flow and profit whilst balancing the inventories of grass, money and livestock. I found it provided me with the tools and strategies to make timely and effective decisions by knowing what to sell, what to buy and what to keep. I know, I know, I now have a better understanding of what cattle are, over, uh, are overpriced and underpriced and look at the market differently, aiming for a sell buy, not a buy sell. In February, I made the decision to early wean my calves. My cows were starting to drop in condition, but I knew by weaning I would reduce their maintenance requirements and let them pick back up before calving again. I was aware I was well over my carrying capacity, but I hadn't come to the terms with the sale of my cows yet. By March, things had not picked up and I had to decide between the sale of the cows or weaners. I made the final decision due to the type, of, type and quality of feed I had. The weaners were sold. I'm grateful that around this time, Hugh and I signed up with RCS's new New South Wales Execu Executive Link Board. We meet three times a year for three years with the aim to improve each other's businesses and keep each other accountable. After, finish, after finishing GFP, I promised myself I wouldn't feed cattle. Never say never, right? In May, I had purchased one load of cotton seed, which I calculated would get me through winter. With the purchase of a neighbouring block of 1,700 acres, I had 1,200 acres of dry feed to graze accompanied with the cotton seed, which would help meet my heavily pregnant cow's protein needs. At our second executive link meeting in May, my board suggested I go home and sell the cows. With only two weeks until I left for Europe and the US, I was determined driving home I would sell. As we got closer to home, I received a call from Dad, who was farm sitting, excited that our first calf had been dropped. I think he was shocked at my disappointment. Due to the nightmare of selling calving cows, I planned out a feed budget which I gave to Jimmy before I left. It showed which paddocks were left to graze and how long I believed they should be in there for. I was confident I had enough dry feed and cotton seed until I got home, also budgeting on leaving enough grass reserves to make sure there was ground cover, uh, that there was ground cover left over. I spent two weeks in Europe with my family and then broke camp to fly to America and meet another 20 Aussie KLR Mastermind members on a once-in-a-lifetime Aussie Grazius ranch tour, known as the Elk Nation. We were lucky enough to visit people like Kit Farrow, Walt Davis, Eunice Williams, Michael Thompson, Gal Fuller, the Hibbards, and many others. After many conversations with ranchers and the Elk Nation, I finally decided selling the cows was the best option moving forward. I think getting away from home did me the world of good. 
I started to look and think of the opportunities that I could be missing by not balancing my grass, livestock and money inventory back home. Once arrived back home, Stu asked the reason why I, was, I had been so he hesitant in selling them. In all honesty, I felt guilty that I had purchased expensive cows. To make it worse, I had to sell them in the middle of a drought and justify the price difference to Dad. He reminded me of the KLR principles and suggested I put together a destocking versus feed budget cash flow to, provide it, uh, to pr prove to myself, Dad, the bank and my accountant that it was worthwhile. The first budget I put together was feeding them until December, hoping by then it would rain and hoping the price would have risen. The other was selling the cows immediately and including no income until the end of the financial year. Pretty scary. I worked out how far in debt I would be, how much I would have left to restock, and if I had any fee, uh, and how much, how sorry, and how much I would have left to restock with if we had feed in the new financial year. Feeding the cows until December was financial, uh, was viable, but I was hoping for rain and hoping the price would rise. It was now easy to realise I could not make a decision based on hope. While the, uh, while the advertising sale and pickup of the cows took place, I picked one paddock to sacrifice. As I said earlier, I had a feed budget. I had feed budgeted only enough grass to get me home without causing too much damage. The paddock I chose was thick with plains grass, which was rank and lignified. Although not nutritionally valuable, I knew its thick tussocks and roots would only create ground cover, not cause bare soil and erosion. This also gave the, paddock, uh, the rest of my paddocks a chance to recover. By the end of September, I had sold most of my cows and heifers. The only animals which stayed were the tallenders, a handful with broken mouths or calves that, uh, cows that hadn't calved yet. As soon as they had trucked, it was a relief. Although a challenging decision, I have not once looked back. The decision has helped my own mental health and well-being, my bank balance, as well as the ecological aspects on the farm. I guess what I've learnt since destocking is it still rains in a drought. Because I have left the paddocks with ground cover, they have responded quicker from smaller falls of rain. Unlike others who have left their paddocks bare, I have a living plant root and plant waiting to respond with even the slightest fall of rain. Even though these rainfall events have been small and sparse, I, no I have noticed on other properties that germination still does take place. The issue I see is with all this hot weather, and the time between falls, each little plant dies and the repeated pattern is continued time and time again. I may not have mentioned earlier, but many of my neighbours have been feeding for at least a year now and heading into their second year. Some other neighbours are going into their third year. Many of them have also grazed sorghum stubble for a large period of last year and have, and have already started putting uh, cattle back on failed sorghum crops this year. You can see in these photos that our boundary fence is all that divides two contrasts of management in drought. I believe that trading suits my business and the season variability. I can purchase stock when I have feed and sell when I do not. I am eliminating emotion and attachment of carrying breeders, which makes destocking again an easier decision. Between selling the cows in the middle of September and early December, I received 118 mils of rain. We also received the same again during December and January. Before, um, before looking at restocking, there were some uh, important planning procedures I went through. This is the KLR Mastermind spreadsheet. I use it to find the most profitable trade that will suit the grass I have on hand. Forecasting and migrating. Forecasting and migrating. I use the forecasting tool to increase the number of LSUs I plan to run with the aim of staying under my benchmark. I, also, I can also change the, re the rainfall received per month, keeping it low to mimic the current dry trend. I have highlighted the rainfall and daily LSUs in yellow. The orange highlight is my total 12 month LSU days per hectare per 100 mils. My benchmark is 15, so the aim is to stay below that. As you can see on the graph, the green line is under the black now. The last thing I do is a feed budget. 
This is the, pad the paddock analytics table exported out of Maya that I slightly modify. I input how much grass is available in each paddock and work out how many months of feed I have available for the animals I'm looking at purchasing. If I cannot finish a trade due to the lack of grass, I will not buy the cattle, as I cannot be certain it will rain between now and when they go. If I purchase them, not, if I purchase them knowing I didn't have enough grass, I would be taking a gamble. If that was the case, I would, need to, I would need to either sell them early or feed them, something I'm not willing to do. I think it is worth noting that I'm currently well below my benchmark. Although a, although a grazing chart is a fantastic tool, you still need to listen to your gut. By following many regenerative principles, I will improve my water holding capacity, build soil organic carbon and increase my carrying capacity. This will not only be creating a functioning ecosystem, but will improve my bottom line. On the screen, I've included some information on the schools and people who have helped me improve my decision making, build my knowledge and add to my toolkit. The other fundamental thing that has helped me has been surrounding myself with like-minded out outside of the box thinkers. I've had many mentors, but to name a few, Terry McCosker, Craig Carter and Stuart Austin. If I could leave you with one thing, it is that knowledge is power, and we are running multi-million dollar businesses largely uneducated. So I believe it's our, responsi our responsibility to educate ourselves about ecological and financial decision making, and arm ourselves with the best tools possible to make those decisions. Thank you.